Hello, everyone. This is Jill. Welcome to the podcast. Have you ever wondered how you can make better choices in life based on the information you have already? Today, we're going to start thinking about betting choices. I think we consider too much the good luck of the early bird and not enough of the bad luck of the early worm. Franklin D. Roosevelt. Do you ever get really mad at football when a coach makes a call? And maybe it's for a Hail Mary at the very end of the game. The other team picks it off. Of course, we knew that was going to happen. Of course, it was going to happen. What a bad decision the coach made. Or in baseball, where a fly goes out to the outfielder. He knows where it's going. And suddenly, the wind blew, the sun was a little bright, and he dropped the ball on the ground. Oh my gosh, what a bad decision he made. But the thing we don't understand is there's a lot of things that go into how we do in life that's not just based on whether or not it was a good decision or a bad decision. There's luck in there too. And that's what makes poker such a compelling game. If you take a look at chess, and a lot of us have been watching this chess mini series, chess is not like real life. Chess is all about one person making a good decision and the other person screwing up. There is no luck in chess. It is a luckless game. It is about making mistakes. It's not like life very much because a lot of times we are influenced by the way luck, random events happen in our lives. And we can't really blame our decisions based on luck. Sometimes we're driving inattentively. We look at our phone. We text a friend. We didn't die. Is that because we've made a great decision? No, it's probably because we had some good conditions. Maybe no one else was on the road and we had luck. Or like that football coach who could have made that same call 99 times and it would have worked. But that one time, it just didn't. And so how can you determine how life should work when there's so much good luck and bad luck based into decisions? And that's what Thinking and Bets by Annie Duke's book is all about. It's about how can we do better even though there are times where things happen that was not in our control. And what can we do to make sure that we have the best decision possible, even without all these things that potentially may happen? So what Annie Duke calls us to do is to think in percentages. This will help us make better decisions and will help us reduce the number of mistakes we have. Of course, there still will be skill in there. There still will be luck in there. But this will help us do better. She talks about how thinking in percentages sometimes can even work when we're not even using the right data. Think about back in medieval times when they didn't know a thing about viruses. But the interesting thing is they cleared away from cities. They avoided certain wells. They picked up based on percentages and seeing what was around them. It helped them survive, even though they didn't have the science down on what was causing disease or other disasters in their lives. You don't have to have an infinite amount of knowledge to avoid bad things. She said that when our ancestors heard noises in the woods, they used their calculated risk to understand that that noise could be an animal, could be something that's going to threaten their camp. So they took evasive action in order to protect themselves using that kind of percentage thinking. So she talks about the fact that there's two kinds of mistakes whenever we're using probability to think about decision making. The first is what's called a type one error when you think that every wrestling is an incoming lion and you're constantly moving your family out of the cave or away from the fire because you're worried that your family's going to get attacked and it never happens. Think about situations where tornado sirens might go off too many times. What happens? People start ignoring it because we believed it to be true one too many times. And then we stop listening to it because it's a false positive. Meanwhile, there's the type two error, and that's a false negative. So in that sense, you heard some wrestling. You said, that doesn't sound like a lion. Turned out to be a lion. Tacked your village. A false negative can be really disastrous. So what we have to do is learn how to reduce both errors. So she said that life like poker is rarely 100% right or wrong. It's incomplete information. We don't know everything. We don't see what the other player has. We don't know what's going on in our lives at work or at home. We don't see all the cards either in poker or in our real lives. And that's why she thinks 
she can help make us make better choices. And mostly what we do is that we bet on our future based on what we already know. If we were in a situation like this before, we use our past knowledge to help us. But sometimes our past knowledge is wrong too. How can we be more objective? So first of all, she said that thinking in right and wrong is the wrong way to go about thinking about any problem because chances are it's somewhat gray in the middle. It's not yes and no, white or black. It's a percentage of how much we were right and how much we were wrong. The first step she wants us to do is to have good quality beliefs that are well-informed, well thought out. They're based on good data. They're the best knowledge that we can get at that time when we have to make an informed choice. And that's where we have to go out and seek true data. We have to strive to be objective. And even in the face of when we believe something is one way, when we're confronted with data that makes it the other way, we have to be open to the fact we may be wrong. And unfortunately, that's not really how we work. You can see in modern times that people will make bad decisions all the time. And not only will they do that, they'll put it on TikTok so we can all have fun with it. Sometimes they make a bad choice and it's sad and devastating. We have to be able to challenge what it is we're thinking. And part of that thinking where we try to learn new data and it falls aligned with our previous thinking was actually something that helped civilizations thrive. There was a study where people were given these jugs of lemonade. And in half the cases, they were supposed to label the lemonade poison. And so they went through. Everyone knew it was just lemonade. It was the same lemonade everybody had. And at the very end, the researcher said, thank you for all of this. We would love for you to stay, have some lemonade, some cookies, and enjoy these treats on us. And what happened? People wouldn't drink the lemonade that was marked as poison, even though they knew it wasn't, even though they knew they're the ones who labeled it. And then she says that we have what she called a self-serving bias. That means that we're biased towards things that really pad our self-esteem or pad what we're thinking. And the weird thing is, is it's not even an education level thing. Some of the greatest people who take information and turn it into what they believe to already be true and not challenge their previous beliefs are people who are great at science and math. Everybody does it. So nobody likes to take blame and we use these self-serving biases to throw things away in case that it may make us feel bad or challenge our belief. I'm a great driver. See, even though I hit that tree when there was nothing else on the road, I'm still a really good driver. She talks about in general society, we're really pushed into never saying, I don't know at work. Well, Jill, why didn't this project work? I don't know. And even in issues of faith, when you're asked, why is this like this instead of like this, you say, I don't know. People don't like answering that. We really need to know that we can answer that way. If we don't know, it's better to say we don't know. It is a vital step, she calls, in making better decisions. She mentions, too, that poker players will have to make decisions based on things they don't know. And it doesn't mean that a poker player can't stop playing their hand because they have incomplete information. They still have to make the next play on the best information they know, even if they don't really know. And she said that the interesting thing about poker is, while an experienced poker player will make overall better choices, that doesn't mean that a veteran might have a better guess than someone who's brand new. Sometimes their own biases get in the way, or sometimes a new person got really lucky, or just saw something that nobody else saw. So you can actually do great being a newcomer to something. Just overall, the experienced person will make better choices. But you see it all the time in business, too, where someone who got directly out of high school, they went to college, they quit college, and then they start up the next computer company. They made better decisions than all the experts out there gave them credit for. In some of those cases, when you have those people who had bright ideas and did really great, they actually went to the experienced people showed them their idea and their data, and the experienced people said no anyway. It happens. Sometimes someone with a fresh perspective does better. She said that what we can do if we find ourselves having motivated reasoning, which means we're doing reasoning based on what we think should be true or what we believe to be true and trying to bolster those beliefs, is that we have to fight that by getting outside views, getting other opinions, getting other data, bringing more information in. 
that will help us fight against it. So she suggests when you're looking at the data to ask yourself some question about how much do you trust the people giving you that data? How up to date is the data? Is it brand new or is it really old? Is it relevant to what we were talking about? A fat versus sugar study came out decades ago that people believe. And then later they found out it was sponsored by the sugar lobby. Of course, sugar wanted to look better than fats. So it had a study and it found that. Then she suggests also looking for what are some other reasons why the study might be wrong. There's a thing called correlation. 100% of everyone who eats carrots dies. Oh, well, that's a terrible statistic. It doesn't mean anything. And then to always ask yourself the question, what am I missing? You want to make sure that you're not overlooking something that's very simple. Like, for example, maybe the person just completely made up the story or they use the data in such a way it cannot be used. There's a lot of information out there. She said that we tend to think that we learn something by we listen to it, we do some analysis of it, and then we decide whether we're going to believe it or not. But as it turns out, that's not how we learn to believe anything. In fact, what we do is we hear something, we decide based on our current knowledge if we're going to believe it or not believe it, and then we look at the data to see how we can pick it apart to bolster our belief. How can we use thinking in bets to better understand something and make better decisions? So instead of saying, oh, that information was wrong or that information was right, for the most part, anything that's false, even outright false, probably had a good percentage of truth in it, which is why it was such a fantastic lie. If something's completely made up, that's a terrible lie because we can recognize it right away. Instead, what she's asking us to do is when we have a belief, assign it a percentage. Well, I was a 75 on that, but after I read that article, I realized that I'm probably more of a 63. That way, it doesn't harm our ego as much to think that we believe something less than we believed it before as compared to saying, oh, I was wrong. What we do is if we can go ahead and when we state something that we think is true, if either in our head or in the conversation can say, I'm kind of a 46 on that decision, that'll help us know how strongly we feel something is true. Might also help the person you're talking to, if you get in the habit of doing that with friends or family, understand how you believe it's true too. I think that this hiking path we're going on tomorrow is not going to be muddy. I'm pretty much a 43 on it. And you might be thinking, hmm, that might not be worth risking getting mud in our boots based on that low-level belief you have in that. So the first step is assigning everything that we believe a percentage. And she said that if we can take ideas and compare them to other like ideas and then also give them a rating, now we have an array of what it's going to be. I have a 43% idea that it's not muddy on my hiking trail tomorrow. And I also believe at a 73% level, it's not going to rain tomorrow. And I have a 100% belief that if it was muddy, we can take the other path that goes uphill and it won't be muddy. There's a good mix of ideas there that will better help us decide something instead of just coming up with a yes or no, right or wrong answer. Then she said that we have this learning loop, that we believe something and then we place a bet on it by giving it a percentage and then we look at the outcome and then we make our next bet based on that information. The next time when you decide you're going to go hiking and you actually go out to that spot and you believe that it was not going to be muddy, you found out, well, this place gets a lot more muddy than I really was giving it credit for. I have to really up my bet about what I believe the muddiness of this path is because it gets muddy all the time. I always give this joke, and it's not really a joke, that I have a terrible sense of direction. So most of the time, if I feel like left is the right decision, chances are right is the best decision. And so sometimes I even think I need to just go the opposite direction. I would place bets on being the right way. And then if we're going to take our ideas and betting in percentages, that's when we're going to bet on a certain idea. That's what part of the execution of it is. So we thought the path won't be muddy. We thought it's not going to rain that day. And we thought we had alternatives to go in case it was. We get to the hiking site and we found out we were entirely wrong. Super muddy. 
That means that the next time we have to adjust our thinking about this place in terms of the data that we found, or if it turned out that we were right, we would improve our decision by continuing to think like we did before. And then she said, that's when luck comes in. We have to remember that sometimes there's just luck. Maybe this park got a little bit more rain than we got at our house. Maybe it just didn't drain very well that day. Who knows why, but it didn't turn out how we thought it was going to be. And that's where we need to also evaluate luck. How can we look at something? No, 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 I made a really great decision. It just turned out I had some bad luck. I think the next time it'll be better. And sometimes that means that we just have to find more information. So that's where we have to sit down and think, is this because I made a bad choice or was it just a little bit of unluck? Come up with a decision and maybe do it again. Those football coaches who decided to do the Hail Mary at the very last play in the very end of the game maybe had some bad luck. Maybe they're going to decide to do that same play better the next time. Or when they look back at the film and they look back at their data, they realize they don't quite have the talent to pull off a Hail Mary at the very end of the game. And based on their informed decision, not the bad luck or the good luck, we're going to not do this again because the outcome would probably be about the same. And so that's why she said that outcomes don't really lead to good decisions. Again, sometimes we drive distracted and it was fine. Nothing happened, but it could have happened and it could have been serious. Or we ended up placing some money in the stock market and ended up making a ton of money. What a great decision I did. But any other time we would have done that, we would have lost everything. We have to carefully analyze, was it good luck for the good outcome, bad luck for the bad outcome, or was it our skill? A careful analysis of that will help. She says that we have to be truth seekers. Talks about the matrix and how we have to do the red pill or the green pill. Do we want to know the truth? Do we want to find out what's true? Or do we want to be in our illusion that we think we know is true? We're going to make all our decisions based on what we think is true, even though we can probably find evidence that it's not. So she said to become a better truth seeker, what we have to do, first of all, is focus on accuracy. How good is the information I'm getting instead of it confirming what it is we always believe and having that open mind to be able to make better decisions. But here's the second part that most people never do that makes all the difference in the world when trying to think in bets. Accountability. Poker has accountability. You make a bad decision, you lose money. You make a bad hand, you lose that hand. How do we bring in accountability in our regular lives so that we know that when we've made a bad decision, we're held accountable for it? And so that might mean a review where we look at the money we're putting in the stock market and then we see how we did. We make a bet at work and we review them at the end of every week to see how we did in making those decisions. And then the third is that we have to just be open to a whole bunch of ideas that may or may not agree with what we think is true. If we're always only looking at our own side, then we're never being challenged. We're never being hit with other ideas. There's a new app out there called Ground News. And what it does is it actually tries to show all the news based on which sides are reporting it. And then it gives you a tab in there called Blindside. And it shows you, based on your own beliefs, what are you missing? What are you totally not even seeing as news? And then she said that if you get a good outcome, you can repeat what you did the last time. But be careful about those blind spots. Make sure that it's just not continuing on itself, that you have some idea that maybe you're going down the wrong way. Summary. Think like a poker player. Realize that you don't know everything that's going on in your life, and that sometimes luck is at play. You made the right decision, but had bad luck. You made the wrong decision, and you had great luck. But if you think like a poker player, you'll be able to make good decisions even when you don't know all the facts. Two, think in percentages. What is the best bet going in? If you had to place money on one of your decisions, where would that decision go? And so instead of thinking, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer, Instead, think of percentages. This is a 10% chance. This is a 40% chance. What has the best odds of being the right decision? That way you're not doing this black and white thinking 
you're actually giving credit to all the ideas out there and deciding what is the best idea. It also means that you lose that hurdle of admitting you were wrong. Instead, you place the bet on something that had a lower percentage of winning. Three, realize there's two types of errors. One is the false positive where you think something is going to happen and it doesn't. And the second, type two error when you think something's not going to happen and it does happen. Make sure that you try to reduce the types of errors you have in your life. Four, realize that we all have a bias about ourselves and about our decisions and what great thoughts we have. The only way to make better decisions is to get away from the bias that we are either fantastic all the time or that we make mistakes all the time and have an honest evaluation of what we decide and what we know. Five, admit I don't know. Remember, you don't have to come up with an answer for everything. When you admit you don't know, that gives you room to investigate why something happens or how it really is. Six, be a truth seeker and always look out for information that's wrong or information that comes from a bad source, even if the bad source didn't mean to do any harm by it. But always look for that truth in whatever it is you are thinking about. Challenge. Try this little experiment. For the next week, try to put percentages based on all your beliefs, whether it's just inside your head or when you're telling someone else, you know, I think there's a 40% chance it's going to rain tomorrow. I think there's a 70% chance I'm going to sleep in. Whatever it is you decide, try assigning percentages to that decision. It will give you a way of evaluating how confident you are about what you're saying or thinking. Now, our fun quote of the day comes from Saturday Night Live with Steve Martin. (laughs) She's dead. Dead! I can't believe my little girl is dead! Now, Mrs. Miller, you're you're distraught, you're tired, you're you may be suffering from nervous exhaustion. May, maybe we'll just take some of your blood too. We'll just You're a charlatan! You killed my children just like you killed the rest of my family! Why don't you admit it? You don't know what you're doing! Wait a minute. <laughs> Perhaps she's right. Perhaps I've been wrong to blindly follow the medical traditions and superstitions of the past centuries. Maybe we barbers should test those assumptions analytically through experimentation and a scientific method. Perhaps this scientific method could be extended to other fields of learning. The natural sciences, art, architecture, navigation. Perhaps I could lead the way to a new age. An age of rebirth. A renaissance. Nah. Well, he almost had the chance of reaching out beyond what he thought he knew and all the decisions he'd been making with his patients and come up with something that's brilliant and futuristic. But then at the end, nah. Thanks so much. I hope you have a wonderful week. And please remember to subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, or visit my website at smallstepspod.com and ask me a question. Tell me what you think or have a suggestion for a topic.